recording when you like, and if I sort of fall out of service, we do have uh, the, uh, our beginning presenter will be Beth Barry, and she knows she'll go first. Sandra Indig, you'll go second. And Wendy, we'll have you go third. And then we just sort of, you know, you can rotate around um, as we go. Just bear with us. Sorry to be traveling during this. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Barry. We're happy to have uh, you. Yeah. Ooh, I know so many people here. Regina, you're going to have to bear with me again when I present tonight. Say something different. I have nothing else to say. <laughs> we say exactly the same it'll thing. Be nice to, it'll be nice to see them again. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, let me know is, if whenever you feel like you want me to start. I, I, we'll wait. What I'll do is I'll, I'll wait okay. a few more minutes. We have 14. I'll just wait maybe two, three minutes. I'll do an introduction. And then uh, I'll sort of hand it off to you. Sophia will be our backup and our front. She's always our front. Thank you. Sophia, you're back in uh, Seattle now? I'm in Portland. That's where my college is, Portland, Oregon. Wow. That's right. I, you know, I was doing so well with that the last few times, and <laughs> I blew it. <laughs> I am back, though. I moving moved into a new dorm. It will be an interesting year. Are you having but in-class classes? Some of them are in, in class. Some of them are online. And I'm also in HA this year, so I have to, like, no one's allowed to even, like, hang out in the common rooms which will be interesting, mm. or go into each other's rooms, will also be interesting. But surviving. Wow, it's a, it's a whole different college experience. It really is, yeah, it's crazy. Not easy being Can I introduce my, my, my friend Andrea? She's here today, first time. Yeah. Michael, yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome. Hi, Andrea. Andrea and I did an exhibition together a few years ago and, uh, on uh, Orchard Street. And she's oh. a director. She works at the Art League of Long Island. She's kind of the program director at the Art League of Long Island. Cool. I remember Good that. Nice to meet so you. Nice. Yeah. nice to meet you too. Jackie, you mentioned you had an exhibition on Sunday. Jackie? Jackie? But you mentioned you had an exhibit on Sunday, an opening somewhere? Oh, it opened last uh, of Saturday, but I didn't go. It's the it's at the uh, the El Barrio Art Space. Town. But I was there. I was oh, in that show. I was at the opening. Oh, Fran goes everywhere. Oh, Fran, yeah. <laughs> I heard that my piece is next to yours, as someone told me. Oh. oh. Yes. Uh, is, is a drawing? Yes, a drawing. I'm going to go next. I think I'm going to go on Sunday. We're going to make an appointment. Excellent. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm going to formally Perry. start the meeting. Okay. Welcome. This is Artist Talk on Art, the ATOA. We're a 501c3. Um, we usually hold our talks downtown the Lower West Side. We've been around for 45 years um, as a nonprofit. Our goal to bring artists together to talk, to share, to create a community. Um, and I think our response to what's been going on with social distancing, it has been these Monday events. And I think it's, it's worked very well. We're continuing our mission. You artists are make it, make it what it is. It is artists talking. And so I appreciate all of your presence and all of your time. And I think you'll find we'll hit some te technical difficulties. We always have people help out with that. And patience is good in everything. So, you know, don't feel wrong. Uh-oh. 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 Barry's freezing up. Yeah. yeah. So Barry, you're Barry freezing up a freezing. bit presentation and 
hit a little glue on a fight. We just take our time. This is your film. So I want to thank you all. I want to continue, Sophia. Feel free to just I am traveling. But I will say, maybe we should just jump right in. Um, again, ATLA, a 501c3. You can visit our website if you'd like to contribute. We do these talks for free. And, uh, you know, your help helps us to make a dent in, in, in our goal and what we try and do. So I, I want to thank you in advance. Um, our, just keep in mind, there are ways to pin the person who's speaking. There's ways to choose the active speaker. And if you have music playing and you're watching, we may end up hearing your music. And unless it's Radiohead, we may say no to that music. Radiohead. So, <laughs> let's just uh, jump right in. We, um, we're going to start with uh, Beth Barry. Welcome, Beth Barry. Great Thank name, you. Beth Barry. And if, Barry. You know how to, if you know how to screen share, go yes. ahead and do the screen share. Sophia. Our intern in Portland, Oregon, who just came back. She's with Reed College, and she is here to facilitate and is currently hosting. Any questions, feel free to ask her. We do have a chat function you can jump into. Keep in mind, you can post your website. You can make comments there. And when people present, we like dialogue. We like the interchange of ideas. We're very positive on positive feedback, any feedback, thumbs up always works, but anything you want to share at any time, you're welcome to. This is our 19th Monday night. It's been a great experience. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I want to thank the board members that I see here. I see Jackie Rada. Thank you, Jackie. I also see uh, Roberta Bernardi, and I may be missing some because I'm not seeing all the participants, but Beth, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. Thank Great. you, Beth Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um, well, I will be screen sharing in another moment or so. Um, so I'll just do that when I need to. I'm very happy to be sharing my work with everyone during this time of social isolation. I say that because that's what I have really felt most during this time of the pande pandemic, a lot of isolation. Initially, I was overwhelmed. I was waking up the first month at three o'clock in the morning, cooking and freezing and chopping and making compulsive food lists. And <laughs> really being ridiculously anxious. And I woke up one morning and I contacted a very close friend of mine who's an artist who I went to college with. And I reached out to her and we just, I asked her if she wanted to paint with me. And that was my first foray back into creating art again. It was very reassuring and very comforting. We've made art together over the years. We used to share a studio many years ago, so I knew it would be very comfortable. And to this, it's, it's, we started in April, and every two or three days we worked together. We put our phones on the shelves uh, and FaceTime and work, and then critique our work together. So that's been a very, very positive, a positive, positive uh, effect of COVID. Before I go and show you my work, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I was a printmaker in college, and then I went on to Pratt to study art therapy. I've been in private practice as a psychotherapist for about 35 years. Um, I continued my art practice, but about 12 years ago, I started to pursue my art more seriously. I'm very happy as an older person to have an art practice. It's, a, it's great to have a challenge and I feel very blessed that I have a creative, a creative experience in my life as we all do. Uh, and a little bit about my work before I show it to you. I've always been interested in landscape or the impression of landscape. I see landscape as fragments of time, as moments of movement that appear and then disappear. And that's all very exciting to me, um, the experience and the feeling of landscape. So the paintings I'm going to show you are really my brainscapes, and they're all in sequence. It's the work I've done since the first piece of artwork with my friend Martha and what I've done since uh, April. So I need to share my screen. So I'm gonna push this share screen button and let me share again. Oh, oh, I lost, I went, I pushed the wrong button. Okay, I'm not there. I'm sharing my screen. Okay, good. Okay, um, okay. Okay, this is my slideshow. This is just me. And I think most of you know Izzy Nova or know of her. She helped me put this together. So this is the first uh, artwork I made with Martha. 
while well, she was on the phone. This is my Corona collage. I do not usually have any lit literal references in my work at all, but because I think of what I was feeling, these first three paintings in these series of paintings have Corona references. Um, I'm sure most of you know about Color Aid paper. I remember it in college and graduate school, the wonderful smell of Color Aid paper. This is, these papers are from the 70s. Uh, and there are hearts here. Again, I never have literal references, but I think my heart was actually breaking during that time. So that's why there are references there. I was in Manhattan and it was just really depressing. Um, so that's my first, and the, the uh, strokes of the pencil are more expressive than I normally uh, had been using the pencil in that way. So that's another difference in that. The next painting was another literal reference because everyone was looking at the virus as a red, the virus was red. The coronavirus everywhere was red. So here we have the virus kind of moving through the sky and uh, moving through the sky and the, um, and the, and the light. I've always liked the way shapes look from airplanes when you have things bobbing and weaving and everything moves with the light and the shape. So that's something that that has a res resonance to. This is the last um, of the COVID related images. And this I made for a, um, a show that's gonna be at the Kupabulis Family Art Museum in Athens. Fran Beeler, who's on this call is also in that show. And this is turbulence. This is, I like to um, challenge myself with having um, complementary colors abut each other and really see what that looks like and how that feels. So, and again, we have more of the expressive brush stroke. Uh, then this is more typical of my uh, post-apocalyptic landscapes. I've always been fascinated by what happens after, um, after natural disasters. There's something eerie and ominous and very primitive about landscapes. And there's something that I really like. I, I find them to be kind of skeletal and really interesting. I have a whole a series of those kinds of paintings uh, on my website. I live in Springs in East Hampton and this is spring in the Springs. Um, this is really, this was the next painting after that. Napig is a place near the water around here that's also very lovely. And this is really a good example of what I, what feeling, what the feeling is of light and movement and the intersection of that. Um, I painted this a peachy terracotta color, pinky color before I, uh, before I did the rest of the painting. So the background color up here was what the whole canvas was painted before I started that, which I often do with uh, landscapes because a white canvas is very challenging and not really very forgiving. Um, Two miles right onto I-84 West. And this, this is another example of more of the primitive kind of landscapes. I'm very interested here in, again, the juxtaposition of uh, complementary colors and also the different qualities of line. I used to draw and felt very limited by pencils. So there's something really exciting to me about being able to kind of create a painted line, not as an edge, but as, as a piece of a shape. So that's burnt orange. Um, this is probably the real, the successful painting of the group of paintings that I made. I don't think, the others are as successful, but I think this painting really, you're directly in the density of, of a forest of sorts. It's a magical forest, but I'm really excited about how the, the uh, space works in that painting. Um, let's see. All the paintings are pretty small because I could only work with what I had. And I actually paint usually larger, but this was what I was uh, limited to. This is swoosh, just the movement of the wave. A lot of my work has water references, but not in this group of paintings from this period of time. But that's really like the, the uh, movement of water in a wave. Um, this is, a, you know, a years ago when I joined the New York Artist Circle, I, as, because I have a, a busy psychotherapy practice, I really didn't feel like I could take classes. So I went through the directory of the New York Artist Circle to see if I could find someone who I could paint with. And I found Marianne Barcelona, whose work I really loved. She never taught before, but she and I started painting in Central Park uh, and did that for many years together. And I often do plein air painting. This is at the bottom of where I live because I really want to push myself in terms of learning more about conventional space. My training was pretty um, not very... Um, uh, 
traditional. So I want to be able to learn more about foreground, middle ground, and background as as so that's the space and how they're integrated in that way. So that's an example of some of the other work, the plein air work that I do. And these last two paintings are collaborations from the U.S. Post Office that I made with uh, Barbara Friedman and with Wendy Moss. And I, I didn't realize when, until I put this presentation together that I started with a collaboration and I ended with one. And I know that the social connections for me as an artist and as an, a person are really very important. So that's my little spiel. And those are the, <laughs> those are the works I've been making in these last months. So I'm going to stop sharing. And that's that. So Good. thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Sure. Hi, Elaine. Hi, Beth. Uh, when you worked with your friend and you were doing plein air, did you actually go outside and work yes. in, the in the environment? Okay. I made that painting outside, yeah. yeah. We both uh, were outdoors. This was a, probably three weeks ago. Um, and I felt like it was okay to be outside, uh, you know, sharing. We weren't that close together. You know, we had our, both of our setups outside. But yeah, that's what I was doing. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Beth, um, yes, I have a question. I don't, did you mention the medium you were using? I, I, I missed no, that. No, I didn't. It's all acrylic and gel mediums, except in the initial collage, which is right. you know, a lot of different materials, and the, yeah. the collages with the USPS projects. Those are mixed media. But I, right. I mostly use gel mediums and different kinds of and acrylic paints. Very nice. OK, it was great. I really, it was a very inspiring group of work, you know, especially given uh, the description that you gave us to begin with, you know, how you got together with somebody and just went out and, you know, I, I think this is a good time for all of us to, because we have sort of no restrictions, because like you said, you're working small because that's all you had to work with. And I had the same situation here. And you know what? It made me do things that I never would do before. Right. So yeah. anyway, that's the good I part. Think, I think it happens. You kind of get forced to challenge yourself in these kinds of times. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. I totally I agree. Have a, oh, sorry. Um, Did you? Sorry. I, yeah, I was, I was curious to, you know, learn more about how your job as a psychotherapist has influenced your work because I've worked actually with um, I shadowed a psychotherapist and artist before and it was really interesting learning from him and how his like kind of fine-tuned knowledge of the mind sort of informed his art and I'm wondering if you know you use your art as a way to become more in tuned with like your work or as a way to more like escape or like how it's influenced your work well, you know, I, I, the psychotherapeutic process is a creative process. It's a collaborative, organic process that doesn't really have a, a, an un, a known end point. And I think making art is, is similar in some ways. The process is similar, even though it's only my own idiosyncratic process. I don't really think about my artwork in an analytic way. I think as an art therapist, I used to hate when uh, I used to work inpatient on a psychiatric unit and all the psychiatrists would be like, oh, what does this mean? And this means this, and this means that. And what I felt like was most important and curative was the creative process itself, that whatever the patients felt they were uh, creating and their experience of the process was what was meaningful. And I think I, I really feel very strongly that that's kind of what matters. You, you, of course, the outcome has to be as artists, you want your outcome to be positive and look good and make sense and have the composition work and all of those variables. But I just, I kind of try to keep them separate. I don't really analyze much about that. That makes a lot of sense. I feel like, yeah, the process of art and like therapy is definitely very similar because there's no exact end point. So that's interesting. Yeah. Mm. And it's kind of in a process. Yeah, yeah I think it has really, uh, two, two different oh. schools of, in art therapy if I'm not mistaken, because I studied it for a while. And I, as a former art teacher, I felt that the, <laughs> I was doing art therapy <laughs> with, my, with my kids because I was just having them do the work. And I really, you know, I think that was one approach that is what you just mentioned, that art is just a process. 
is cathartic, it's, it's, it's enriching, it's a lot. And we don't necessarily have to analyze from the other point of view. I mean, right. I, I just right. feel that's not our stuff. <laughs> Although the age of insight, right, Sandra? Who knows? <laughs> So, Beth, I had a, a couple of questions. Hi, how are you doing? I had a couple of questions, um, one technical and one uh, about the artwork. So there was one piece in particular, it was orange. It even had orange in the title. I don't remember exactly the title. And it, it looked like a reflection. And then I realized that a bunch of your pieces seem to have reflection kind of elements. And I wonder if that's something you meant to put in there, if that's just something that comes up, or do you see it and it happens and you go with it? Or That's interesting. You know, I, uh, now that you're mentioning that about burnt orange, it does. It looks like there's a top and a bottom and they're reflecting, mm -hmm. reflective of each other. No, I don't. Uh, you know, I think maybe through the repetition of shapes, the organic shapes, and I'm working with transparencies. I think maybe I'm moving in a direction of looking at things in a more reflective way because I think transparencies help you do that, but it is not conscious. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, the work looked beautiful. It was great to see the progression. I like the way you put together the slideshow. And that's my second question. Did you use Google Slides or some oh, other slide? Um, Microsoft PowerPoint. PowerPoint, straight ahead PowerPoint. Okay. That Very was nice. It. No, just simple. Nicely done. Thank you. Yeah, very, very nice, Beth. Very nice. I, I liked one of your works. It, you know, when you looked at it on a visual level, it read flat one of your landscapes at the bottom. And then the, the horizon, which was two thirds up, receded. And you got a nice effect. Not unlike uh, uh, a painter's name is not coming to mind right now, would also do the painter of cupcakes. Uh, if you know who I'm referring to. Wayne Tebow. Oh, I love Wayne, Wayne Tebow. Tebow. He'll also do landscapes where they read very flat for the bottom two thirds, and then it moves back and you, you have a nice play. Um, it's sort of you're taking control of your perspective. You can certainly see your movement, your flow, and uh, the complementary colors sort of add to the, the sort of strength or action in a painting. No question about it. Um, well shared, and thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're going to move to uh, Sandra Indig. Sandra, right. yeah. hi, welcome. Hi. I'm going to, uh, I hope I don't have any technical difficulties. I think I have to exit the full screen to get onto my PowerPoint. Oh, we'll be very patient. Take your time. Yeah. I, do you have, I can walk you have, through it too. Do you, do you have to co-host me in order to for me to get this up? No. Uh, no. Um, okay. Uh, it's on my screen. Is it on yours? I have to do share screen, Sandra. The green yeah. button. Yeah. The bottom. If you the go on to Zoom button. and press the green button that says share screen. Oh, I have to go back to Zoom. Mm-hmm. Or Zoom meeting? Well, Zoom. we're, yeah, we're, we're talking. Zoom. Yeah, the, the, the site where you okay. see all of the faces. Okay. She's got it. Now, share. Yeah. Yeah, there Ooh. you go. Ooh, she did it. I get right. applause. I Excellent. Just, please clap for all of you. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's really a su wonderful surprise for me. You're great. Yeah, this is a PowerPoint, and uh, believe it or not, or I don't believe it, I um, I was able to do it. I, they, they make it fairly um, doable, and I do not do well with the computer. But anyway, I, I'm really um, pleased to be following Beth Barry. Uh, we have a very, very similar background. I am uh, also a psychotherapist, psychoanalyst, and arts therapist, and specialize in movement and body therapy as well. I uh, work with addiction and um, all kinds of stuff anyway. Um, and uh, to get back to that last question about the similarity between um, art and uh, 
therapy or psychotherapy is that both strong, for me anyway, I visualize words. That's what I do. So when a patient is talking to me, I can visualize what they are saying. And this helps me get back to or get into their central dynamic. The same way that in a painting, particularly my own painting, um, I look for the heart of the painting. Where is the heart? Where is it beating? Where is it alive? Um, this image, um, I, uh, I did early in my art practice. Um, it was an awakening. Um, in this painting, I think you can clearly see that the object of the painting, the female woman, and I see the object above her as the bird, which I did not recognize initially, and then I saw it. Uh, you can see that she appears to be quite troubled. Uh, there was a lot of chaos going on in my life, internally and externally. It was in the 60s. And there was a lot going on in the world. Um, I, I don't know, uh, some of you remember the 60s and remember what happened. It was the time of the Vietnam War, the civil rights. President Kennedy was assassinated and so was Martin Luther King. We put a man on the moon, there was the Cuban Missile you know, on and on. And there was the emergence of legal equality rights for women. So that was very important. I have to admit uh, that I spent most of my reflective life steeped in thinking, painting, and writing about the miracle of creation, the creative process, the creation of the symbol, of symbolizing experience itself. Uh, which I think painting and poetry and dance, all art forms do. Um, my lifelong interest in mythology, archaeology, how, what, and where, and when, and for what reason, those questions brought me to a greater awareness of my own history, my own psychohistory, and my relationship internal and external, personally, and for the world outside, my ontological, if you will, existence. Um, this first work, um, you know, is done in oil. It's um, 14 by 18. I was living at the time in what was formerly a cold water flat on Christopher Street, 35 Christopher Street. And um, it was one of those places where, you know, you jumped into the sink to take a bath or a shower. Mm -hmm. I, I took down the cabinets and I put up a shower curtain, I climbed in. And I went to the Leroy Street Pool, the Tony DiNapoli Center to wash my hair. I had very long hair at the time. All right, <laughs> it was wild. And uh, anyway, <laughs> it was a time. Um, different world then. Uh, anyway, um, then uh, I want to get to the second work. Oops. Oh, there she is. Okay. I, I call this is done in acrylic. Oh, no, this is still done in oil. I've called it just temporarily mirror mirror or it was called that and I, I'm thinking of renaming it because um, I did present this painting to one of my artist study groups and through their eyes which I loved I, I see I see the painting differently so I'm considering it calling it two as one or two as one, yeah. Um, and I want to elicit references to desire, wishes for, and fears of union, because I think this work is not so self-centered as the other, but really is about two beings fusing or meshing as, as one, 
something is experienced together. And if it's experienced together, perhaps it's larger than its original meaning or purpose. Um, I like that thought. Yeah, I, did I say the size? I don't know. It was, that's 54 by 48. Um, the next one, uh, this is one of the panels. It's the first of three panels and it's called Aviva's Odyssey. It's panel one of three. It was, about, it was done after the tragic loss of a dear friend. And it's, I think it was part of my mourning process. And someone really means a lot to me, for whatever reason, just meaningful union. If they're gone, I tend, and I tend to do this way ahead of their passing or sometime before. I think it's sort of prophetic, but then artists have always been uh, earmarked as soothsayers, if not nuts, <laughs> certainly soothsayers. So this is part of my mourning process. It is a statement about the passage and meaning of the life cycle. Um, so I think that you can see many layers. There's some in pasto here. There's some um, veil, many veils of color. That's so I, I sometimes I tend to work in layers and layers and layers. Um, I work a lot like Leonard Cohn. It takes me a long time, usually, to do something. Um, so uh, it wasn't done in 15 minutes, let's say. Okay. We have that many artists share their thoughts and, you know, some artists feel um, it's better to express and the creative uh, thoughts come out more freely in a short burst and other artists go back and back. And so I think what we've learned is it's your choice. Um, I don't think there is one approach to an artwork. It's whatever approach you find. I will say in this work here, it does seem to have dimensions. It is sort of broken out into a Rothko sort of breakout with the horizon lines in a very good way. And, uh, you know, it's a very nice work. Thank you. I love Rothko, so thanks for that reference. Um, yeah, well, some of the paintings take a long time and others, as you say, and I have one of them, a couple of them here, are done in a great big burst of energy. It's just an explosion. Okay. Um, uh, by the way, um, the three paintings, Fire and Ice, Mirror, Mirror, and Aviva's Odyssey, are part of the 26 mostly large canvas collection called the Charles Street Collection. Uh, the paintings date from the 60s. Many were realized painted in various residencies. Canvases one and two, that's uh, Fire and Ice and Mirror and Mirror, uh, were painted, I know, at the McDowell Colony for the Creative Arts in New Hampshire. Uh, sometime uh, in the 20s, uh, I paused, I was in my 20s, um, I paused long enough to look at, I think I meant that, I meant the 2020s, not the 1920s. Um, I paused long enough to look at some of my output over the years, became willing to share the total with trusted friends. Encouraged to take the next step, I said yes, surprising myself, to a wonderful publisher. Fast forward to 2016, my book, Talking Colors, Seeing Words, Hearing Images, was published by Mind Men Publishing. I have chosen one out of the 26 images and poems of the same title to show. It is titled, and here we have the burst. Uh, it was titled, Beautiful. Cancer Nine and Threads of Hope. It's a series. Uh, each panel, um, is um, 
8 by 10, and it has been exhibited, I know, in Canada at a conference, I think, by the International Psychohistorical Society. Um, the thread of hope is so joyful. Yes, it is definitely, that is definitely the threads of hope. Um, it, it's called, uh, let's see, it's eight, each panel of 10. The painting was done shortly before leaving for the airport from Konos, Lithuania to New York City. The series was my safety valve from which I could let go of some of the terror and horror I had experienced the day before when I visit, visited Camp Nine, a World War II detention center for Jews, rounded up for, one assumes, extermination. Mm -hmm. uh, it was heart-wrenching. I, I still remember it very vividly. Gratefully, the gift of art gave me the tools to produce pressure thick, convoluted strokes perhaps indicative of the troubled, diseased brain that could conjure up acts of depravity. To the right, mostly light strokes, suggesting body lug swirls with lines resembling legs and feet, suggesting celebration, perhaps dancing. Dance, especially circular dance, makes us more human, more connect, connected, and certainly more empathic. So, um, these were done in a great burst of energy and again acted as a kind of pressure valve for a great deal of anger and sadness that I was feeling uh, and barely able to contain. Um, I must stress that this image was a company on, on the left of the words in the book and on the right is the image, but one is not meant to illustrate the other. People look at the work and try to see if the words and the image match. <laughs> that's, not, that's not my intention. Um, I, but I hope that the two are synergistic and amplify and augment the other. Okay, the poem has the same name and I will only read a few lines. Costly monuments, weighty memorials, and mind-numbing testimonials addressed address to the buried, burned and beheaded, because they were not like me. not like me. They were most like the other, the mysterious them. For they were akin to lost, dispensable, and disposable addresses. Um, of course, it goes on, and uh, I, I felt that this poem very much, except for the beheading here, yet, <laughs> uh, very much aligns itself with a lot of what's going on now. It's, it's a very present, this was written a few years ago. Uh, it could be as many as six, I'm not sure. Um, but I think it still resonates now, it did for me. Um, okay, to return to my earlier, perhaps, prophetic painting. Uh, I think Jackie will recognize this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, you know, I talked about Iceland, and I introduced with fire and ice, so I felt it was, so like a lifetime later, um, I visit Iceland, and Maria Barcelona um, did a workshop there, we were in residence, we were about eight or so of us, and, and Jackie was there, which was great, um, and um, so I was in the land of ice and fire and ice. It was very magical. It was incredible, intense. I was very taken, not only with the landscape, but with the people who were lovely, especially our hostess. 
And I was also taken very much by the mythology and stories about rocks. I love rocks, I love mountains, I love stone formations, and I love water. The, the rocks, uh, which can be seen all over in the water on the land, they are the remains of explosions and of geysers and so on. A small group of us, as I said, did, did collages and used ink. So it, it, it was really a great time. Okay. Very nice, very nice, Sandra. I also like your black and white works very much. They sort of had a, uh, a free hand, sort of the thickness and the thickness of lines. Yeah. That created, up a, created a very interesting work in that earlier one. And these uh, the largely uh, red works you're both working flat, but I could see where you added and took away. And so the positive and the negative pushes back and forth, creating a nice sort of a challenging visual space in a very positive way. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think, like, uh, many of you know, I, I danced most of my life, and I think that's evident in my work. And I think it was evident in Beth's work, too, this very taken with rhythm. I, I think that I, I, my work, my thinking is body centered. I don't separate the head from the body, or the mind from the body. I, I believe they're, they're interconnected. I know this is a very old concept, but some of, of us get too obsessed with what's going on with our minds and we forgot, we forget our bodies and then our bodies blow out, you know, you get pains, you get all kinds of things that we don't need. Um, so I, I will, I will recommend that thought that you're hitting on. Um, there's a Gurdjieff Foundation. I don't know if any of you are familiar with George Gurdjieff, oh, and he, he definitely goes into uh, uh, feeling, <laughs> sensing, and thinking. And uh, from his book, you realize you've got to do it all. You've got to integrate all of yourself to be a whole. Um, and often people maybe focus on the physical or they focus on the mental, but uh, it's often the full package that makes us round. Right. Uh, didn't Ospensky write the book? Ospensky wrote the book, The Search for the Meaning of Life. Yeah. I've recommended a few books here. That could be the best book ever written by anybody. Uh, Search for the Meaning of Life by... Uspensky. I'll type it into the chat. It is a mind-opening book and very much begins with a lot of psychology and psychiatry. Um, and Gurdjieff was a, uh, a big, broad thinker, and he incorporated music, numerology. It's a shame most people don't know about him, but the society was kept secret, purposely, feeling you have to go out Um, I yeah, want to. Um, there's a film, a wonderful film called Remarkable Men. I'm sure you know it. And I just want to add that my dance teacher, Olga Lay, one of my first teachers, uh, she was a little girl, but that, that family in Russia knew, uh, knew him. Okay, <laughs> let me go on to the next one. Um, yeah, Let's see, my mouse. So to jump into, I'm really fast forwarding, but I know I'm watching the time. I present, like many of you, I am in my resurrected home studio called the Abington Square Studio, which was the name of the studio I had worked in for 25 years on 14th Street above Ruth Kligman. And those of you read the Ninth Street women know about her and others know. Um, so this is called, um, well, it's my night works. I don't think, I don't know, I don't have to look what a title I gave it. So on the right, we, I, this is kind of like, we 
recalling the memory of Louise Bourgeois, um, who, when I was reading about her, did night works. I mean, she was an insomniac, so that's what she did. And I recently presented a paper on her at the IPA, uh, International Psychohistory Association at NYU, on her and to a study group of artists. I like referring to my works emerging at 3 a.m. As, as opposed to cooking, and sometimes, I, and sometimes I cook, but sometimes I draw. It's my response from out of the darkness to this new strange world where my life and the life of others around me has been reduced, restricted, and thought. This experience has brought me inside the ecstasy of first sight. You know, when you see something startling, fills you with awe the first time. Sometimes forms and shapes emerge or fall onto the paper, appearing like petroglyphs. And that ghost um, drawing on the left is the petroglyph. You know, like the, what I call a petroglyph, my version of a petroglyph that I saw and was amazed at uh, when I was out west, I think in Arizona, these like prehistoric or something, drawings into the rocks, they're wonderful, I love them. Um, so um, these are really small, they're nine by 11, but they function as a two dimensional equivalent of feelings. These contractions, I think you can see that that red contraction, that C shape, particularly, it's very clear in the petroglyph, as I call it, um, that it functions as a two dimensional equivalent of feeling. These contractions are hopefully making space for the new forms, new insights new relationships and deeper meaningfulness, meaningfulness, oh, meaningfulness, great, I got it. Um, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you recall that the world as Moses, as the gods or Hashem saw it, had to be contracted to make space for, for a new world. I'm just mentioning that. Um, let, me, let me ask you, Sandra, let me ask you, I think uh, both uh, you and uh, uh, Beth Barry pointed out you, you are psychologists or psychiatrists and you've worked in the field. Um, how has your work been revelation for yourself? Um. Well, frankly, I think living without creativity would be certain death for me. I mean, you might as well knock me off. Um, I find that, um, and I find my, my work with patients, even if they're not creative uh, or don't appear to be, you know, they're not making objects or anything. My job, I think, is what I try to do is find creative solutions for with them to, um, to not focus on the illness, but focus on the strength. And I try to do the same in my own life if possible or whenever possible. Um, you know, uh, as Beth gave a very good summary, um, I'm a psychoanalyst and I can do counseling, but that's not my focus. Um, and when I use images, I use them uh, as one would dream work. And it's not my interpretation. It's really how the patient sees the work themselves. It's not mine. I mean, I'm not trying to be there to show the patient how smart I am. I don't know how smart I am or not. But the important thing is to the patient to learn how to be their own therapist. So when they walk out the door, they can live their own lives. Um, and uh, people who work with me long enough, because it, it does take a long time to redo your structure. Um, 
uh, certainly with addiction, this is very, very true. Everything has to be redone. And, uh, I assume I assume you're very familiar with Carl Jung. Yes. A big fan. Yeah, you, you mentioned some critical things that made me think of them even earlier. And Carl Jung actually used his dreams to sort of, after he would dream, he did the famous Red Book, which is not that well known, but he did amazing outsider artworks that were quite mystical. And he was, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think of him, but he was quite the artist. And he used it as a way to bring out, to flesh out his thoughts, maybe in the same way that you're doing in your work. No, I hope so. Yeah, I think it's it's a, it's a depository. Of, you know, it allows you to edit your life. It allows you to edit the, you know, it, it's, and you go back and you look at it. And many people keep journals, and I, I think of the artwork as journals as well. Um, in a way, it's memorializing, you know, our, our life together. That's what it is. Um, and um, I have the last work here, which I call Blue Line. And I think it speaks for itself. I'm, I'm not going to comment <laughs> at all. But no, I, that's I, a very successful, very successful painting. Uh, no question about it. I, I sense you went back into this painting a lot more. Uh, uh, no, I don't think I did. I think this, I mean, it wasn't done in 20 minutes, no. But, um, it certainly didn't take as long as I know uh, Aviva's Odyssey did. It was done faster. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought it was a good way to conclude and to thank everyone, uh, I really humbly thank you for letting me share this time uh, to talk about creativity and my involvement with creativity. I, we skimmed, that's all we have time to do, but I, I'm very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. I want to open it up to questions and thoughts from anybody. It's a beautiful presentation. That last work, a real knockout, Sandra. <laughs> thank you. It was exhibited at the Salma Gundy Club, by the way. Very nice. Well, well, we'll go ahead. We'll, we'll move on. If you can unscreen share, um, we're going to move on to Wendy. Wendy, I'm not sure of your last name. I just want to say briefly again, this is Artist Talk on Art. We're a 501c3. Everything we do here is free if you'd like to contribute. You can visit, visit our website. There's also a chat function here. If anybody wants to put emails, websites, anything you want to say, feel free to do that. And uh, thank you all for sharing so far. And uh, it's interesting. We've had two psychologists sort of start off um, the process today. It's very nice, a little uh, cohesion in our group. Um, so uh, again, Let's move to Wendy. Wendy, uh, introduce yourself and welcome. Hi. So my name is Wendy Liss, L-I-S-S, -S, Liss. And I am a Philadelphia ceramic artist. And uh, first I'm just gonna, you know, share a little bit about myself and my work. And then I'm just gonna show you around my studio and share what I'm up to in this moment, okay? No, I don't have like a slideshow prepared. This is, um, Barry said it's casual and we can just be informal about it. So um, what I would like to say is in my work, I have two ways of working and um, I'll share with you what that is, but that my real goal and intention for the year of 2020 was to have a year of clarity of vision where um, I was gonna use this time to integrate um, all parts of myself, like what Sandra was talking about, this idea of, um, I also love dance and gesture, and I hope that you'll see that in my work. And, but my, my two like clear ways of working 
is um, with thick slabs, kind of ripped and um, just, you know, organic movement. And, and after I do a body of work like that, I tend to want to um, work more refined, less raw, thin, um, thin walls. And, you know, for a while I was, uh, well, I don't want to say tortured, but listen, I'll be honest. I was, I've been a little tortured. What is my style? How, which way am I supposed to be? And, and in a moment of reckoning with myself, I just said, you know, Wendy, you like to dress differently. You like to dance to different music. You like to listen to different music. You like to read different books. Like, why do you have to pick one way of being? But um, even before COVID came along, I really, because of, you know, in honor of 2020 and clarity of vision, I really just felt like I wanted to make this year be my chance to kind of bring it all together for myself. And now with COVID and literally being like living in my studio space, um, I'm starting to work that out. So this is what I'm gonna to talk to you about and I hope that you'll share. Um, the first thing I'm gonna show you is something that I looked at and one day said, hmm, maybe that's the answer stacking things, coming into the studio, doing my different ways of working, and then finding a way to build them together, stacked on, on top of each other, or somehow I'll create a relationship between them. Because, you know, at first, when all this happened, I got really into just creating vessels and this idea of containment. I was feeling so contained and that it was time to simplify my life and simplify my work. Everything felt like um, the world was so complicated and complex. I just wanted to kind of hunker down in my space and simplify, simplify. Um, but then after that, I got this urge to get a little wild again. And then I just said, how can you integrate these parts of yourself and bring it together? So that's what I'm working on. And um, I'm really open to feedback and, um, you know, so, um, and in feeling so isolated, I, I, I've been joining these talks and listening to artists and just being incredibly inspired by uh, the sense of community and conversation. So, um, so let me just turn my screen and uh, I'll show you around my studio. So let's just say this piece right there is what made me think about the raw edges next to the soft, um, you know, the harder edges. I'm just gonna bring you around and then we'll just talk about it later. Well, so these are some of the thinner pieces that are vessels and uh, just focused on this idea of containment. The figure is always uh, somehow present in my work and connection and relationships of things to one another is, is a theme. You know, I'll just share with you what's on the shelf right now. And then these are some of the, the more raw edged. Um, so this is my first attempt at combining this idea of vessel and, and the raw edge. Beautiful piece. So now we'll just come over here a bit. Oh, something else I play with um, pit firing. So some of the pieces are pit fired. I don't know, just. All right, we'll go over here and then I'll show you what I'm doing now. Nice. So once again, those you know, are really nice. The way the, the pairs work, the the interaction between the uh, sculptors that have two pieces is beautiful. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. lyrical. 
They just move. So Thank you. I would really like to do more of that. Oh, that's a great um, color too. Yeah, I love that. It is. Beautiful. Yeah, so this, this piece was inspired by that stone right there. Oh. <laughs> They feel and a this, lot like nature, and like seashells. And of course, you can tell what this piece was inspired by. A robin's egg, a robin's <laughs> egg. Right color. And then, and then these are some pit fired pieces. Wow. Nice. Beautiful. So, Beautiful. so in here, I'll just share a little. <laughs> colors, I love it. Right? Pulling oh, the colors yeah. from nature. So this was a big breakthrough for me to start to add mason stain pigment into the clay body itself so that it can feel more like a a stone and a natural part of of the piece rather than um like nail polish or surface treatment here let me take this little um well whatever there okay so here so this is what i'm playing with now this ripped edge let me see is this better and yes. then putting them smoother. No, I feel like I need to be vertical. Sorry for flipping you. <laughs> um, so Are I started making forms and stacking. Hmm? Are you using your cell phone to walk around the studio? Yeah, it's an iPad. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Nice, beautiful. Yeah, you do have a lot of vertical elements there. <laughs> right, that's why I turned my screen vertical, just felt like it made more sense. But yeah. so, you know, so the point is, uh, I'm doing a bunch of these smooth pieces, and then I'm going to contrast them, you know, with some of this. Can we see the figure in the background there to the, no, it's all the way in the back by a glass or something? Yeah, to, right there, yeah. That? That's a yeah, beautiful here, let me bring it out. Yeah. Wow. That one. It's dancing. Yeah. Dancing. I'm attracted to a dancing figure. Beautiful. Yeah, so I, I, oh, I feel figures, I feel self-portraits in the work. I always feel like this piece up here is um, like, like this is literally, a, hmm. you know, a, a form of my body. I can see that. So those, so, they're not glazed, it's just fired. Uh, no, this is, these are glazed. So this is glazed, these are all glazed, but what I, they inspired me to want to not glaze and these pieces are not glazed. These pieces have the color inside the clay body itself. Oh, I absolutely I love, love that them. idea. And you oh, had a brown so interesting. one. You had a brown one. On the, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, I had a brown one. Oh, that was fabulous. That was on the other side. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to flip back to me so we can talk. <laughs> mm, okay. All right. Okay. Hi. 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 Where Where are you with all those trees around you? Yeah. So I'm in the suburbs of, you know, Philadelphia, right outside of Philadelphia. Looks nice. It It is. I have um, to say. The rock. I think they were raccoon pieces. The dark ones. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, they're not raccoon. Pit fire. Pit fire. Yeah, the black ones. Those were very interesting to me, more so than the colored ones, because the colored ones were more decorative and okay. uh, more painterly. And uh, the other ones were very raw, and I could have visualized them really big. And I was wondering whether you had an intention to make them very big. No, I mean, this is something I'm interested to talk about because, you know, I started to do the pit firing it to incorporate some unpredictability to the work, it, you know, and to, um, but, well, I'm just gonna be honest and say, I had a little negative experience with some collectors that came to the studio and they felt 
they really had a negative response to all the black and that it felt like death and burnt and and um it just it wasn't i wasn't projecting what my intention was and so it made me shy away from the pit firings for a bit and then well, i started well, you can combine the two maybe then if you're getting and that that's, kind of but I think the I, answers I, then combine the other ones the colorful ones I, I could see where you're going with that but they're uh they were too uh, they were decorative i mean they, they come across as decorative so your intent is that's so interesting yeah. It's so interesting, Olga, and you responded, you know, the, really felt those pieces and loved them, and this other person had this other feeling, you know, I think it just shows as an artist, you have to go with what you feel and just trust that the people who are going to love it are going to be there, you know, like Definitely. Olga, you have to, they are going to be, you know, so that's great. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say that um, just from your from right now, I don't really know you at all, but I I think you need to know that you are much better than you think you are. I think you're really like hard on yourself. And there's something, the idea of doing, of having an idea even before you do the piece can sometimes be a downfall and work against the possibilities that are actually at hand. If you felt like doing black that day, it's valid. I think there, I, and I think getting a good response is just as confusing as getting criticism. Because it's like, wow, should I make more of those? Because they <laughs> love those, like, what, two of those? You know, that kind of thing. So you have to, or, you have to really trust yourself. You know more than you think you know. And I think we get to this point in our lives, I'm speaking for myself, but I will share, is that we're at the, if, if not now, when? You're not, I mean, if you're doing the work to sell it, which I don't think you are, you're doing the work because you have something to say, period. They are, it's a privilege for them to come and visit you. And if they don't like it or they don't respond, that's not your collector. Yeah, and I totally responded to, to your process. You said that, you know, how you jump around and you incorporate a lot of different things, which is my process. And, but I think you're trying to integrate, is, is that right? To integrate yeah is, so what do you think should i not be trying no. to integrate I you know, answers. I, <laughs> yeah i i i i like the I, my work has always been about fragmentation and i do hop around like you and i uh initially long time ago thought well you know what you know who else is working this way i thought it was there was something wrong but no there's no wrong way to work you know if that's what you're comfortable with that's what you go with. If you want to integrate, integrate. I don't want to integrate. All right. So you're, see, you're right. Because I would question myself. Like, I had to decide. Like, are no, you, like, no. why? But then I no. realized, like, I'm telling you, I came to terms with that, you know, a couple years ago where I just said, own how you feel in the moment. And if you want to do thick slabs and roll and rip and be wild and crazy, do that. Oh, and right. then... Once you get exhausted from that, if you want to be more refined and smooth and hard edge and finished, yeah. then just own that in yourself. You can do both. You, you know, why not? Yeah. And absolutely. I absolutely. absolutely. Now, I really, I feel like I really um, responded to both in their own ways. I thought your more delicate pieces had such nuance and that you were just so aware of the surface and I mean, there was a flow to those pieces that was really beautiful. And it was just more refined than the rougher version that you got in the more sculptural, you know, the heavier pieces. I don't know if you can combine them or if you need to, unless you feel like it at the time. I mean, I don't know if you ever leave a piece partially unglazed and partially glazed or, you know, if it's interesting. I just think you shouldn't think about it. I mean, you just yeah, have such good right. impulses that you should yeah. go with it each time. 
no one yeah. piece is the end. You know, that's the nice thing about these. It's not going to take you a year to do one. You can do both. Uh, and see, and just, mm -hmm. I think by doing both and letting yourself just be, you're going to come to some natural resolution without having to force it. I wouldn't force it. No, let the clay speak to you. I yes, do, I believe me, I do. But yes. being alone in the studio yes. during this time has been very like, you know, I go Difficult. from um, mostly just tapping into intuition and going with how I feel. But then because of, quite honestly, my lack of communication with others and just being here all alone with myself, I, I start to think I need to be problem solving and, and you know, like there's a time to do and then there's a time to kind of analyze what you've done. I mean, that's how I feel. That's just the rhythm of my life, you, you know, so um but it's just kind of funny because like I'm looking at my two, I have two business cards. So like here's <laughs> one smile. And yeah, that's the stuff that does sell more. And then here's that one because I couldn't even decide, right? It makes and sense that you have it makes sense that you'd have two business cards. It really does, because you really are you're into the feeling divided. Problems. Yeah, I'm Do feeling you divided. Look, I just have to say this. Look at this. What if not now, when, right? So don't think I'm not thinking that. Oh, <laughs> do you draw at all? Do you draw at all? Yeah, I do. I do. And, you know, on some other meeting, I'll share my paintings and drawings. Because the, the, um, the beautiful, organic, um, natural, the, the um, sculptures that are like bodies have such a beautiful movement to them. Well, and I, I can show you one thing. I have one thing in my studio um, hanging. Just, the colors are great. Just to give you a sense of. Mm, Very nice. Can we it's see it? I don't know. It's, a, it's an etching, right? It's it, it's trees. It's a mono print, and it's trees, but it shows a similar mm -hmm. movement of of the work. And yeah, yeah. there's a lot of resonance there. Right. right. Wendy, I like you the table ever... behind you, actually, uh, Wendy. It looks like a really nice conversation piece, the table with all the different pieces on there. It looks like a really nice tableau. Yeah. Wendy, when you get up in the morning and you go into the studio, do you have some sort of agenda? Um, I, I, I mean, a, a little bit. I mean, because you know, I have to just that? decide, you know, what clay body am I working with, what palette, or, you know, if I'm gonna, if I'm mixing the uh, the color into the clay body now, I do need to like establish a palette before I begin. But then, you know, within that palette, and maybe, and I haven't done this yet, and maybe this is what I need to do, is do the colored clay body and then pit fire it and let the smoke do its thing or whatever and <laughs> but even yeah. that's too far in advance just like i know but guys... i have to i do have a, a little intention why don't you just experiment <laughs> experiment with all kinds of possibilities and just you know play with Feel that out. having fun is is a big part of it and having fun and throwing it away or putting it so you don't have to show anybody and I, I do believe me, I do. But I also believe understand. Me, I, it, I also understand intention and structure. Mm -hmm. So I think it sometimes can get a really bad rap. And but I think if you're a structured, intentional person, it's hard to find a way to not have that be part of a process. And I think that's fine too. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, like with building ceramic work. Within the freedom, you need to construct something that's not going to crack and fall apart. Like you have to be responsible a bit about how you put things together uh, and the integrity of the work. If you, you know, so so it's it's a balance. I just think it's a real balance between the freedom and and what you know you need to do to make it functional or you know and i just and i really think it's just like the same thing in life it, you know i just think um there's a balance between structure and complete freedom and 
you know, thinking about things and trusting your intuition and feeling it. And I just feel like it's a real balance. So, yeah, that's a good approach. Well said, Wendy. Well said. Very nice presentation. And by the way, I there's no better way or worse way to present here. Us getting a real view of your studio has, you know, it, it really gives us a real nice view into where you work, how you work. And uh, that was a, a special presentation. Um, you work uh, very interesting. I do ceramics. I can certainly appreciate it and enjoy. I do want to ask, uh, are you a fan of Peter Volkis? Well, you know, yes, and but it's, you know, but, you know, Peter, you know, did things that were just massive and all, you know, and he also just put you this way. I don't want to do things that look like Peter Volkus, okay? But what I would like to take away from his work is the, there's a freedom of construction and an unselfconsciousness and, um, and all of that I can relate to that I would really like to take, you know, with me. But, but I have a and much more a, refined way about me than him. Also a very strong edge. He, he will work with that ripped edge. I do want to say whenever I, I mention another artist, I'm not implying you're looking at another artist and you're drawing. I'm more implying you're reaching from the pool, the cloud of art, and you're pulling something down that somebody else has pulled down. And so you've shared a, a thread of rain from the creative cloud with someone else. And it often comes out in similar form. Of course, it has you in there, you know, your own spin. Uh, I think it's great that you reach for a solution to color your clay. I think you're both at times working in a geometric format and at other times, you're working in a looser format and the contrast of pit firing and the other work. I like that. I will warn everyone. I think everyone in this group made great comments to you. Beware of what people say to you that is negative. They are usually way off base. It is their problems that they're dealing with. And unfortunately it hurts artists a lot to hear those kind of things and it can throw you off track. On the other hand, like many of you said, if not now, when we are artists, maybe we can't control the rain, we can't control COVID, the train won't even come on time. But when you come to your practices, you're controlling everything within constraints. There are so many more constraints in clay than there are in pen and pencil work or oil paints or acrylics, which have their drying times and all their specifics but clay is another animal that you have to work with and respect or else it'll crack, it, it will sag, it will do things. And part of the beauty is working within those limitations, knowing how to push them and knowing how to respect them. So thank you, Wendy. That was a beautiful presentation. Well, thank, and everybody's thank you, responses, Barry. I everybody's responses, what you said. all thumbs up there. I thought it was a great sort of, hive response uh, uh, like very much. I do want to go on to another presenter and I will sort of go randomly if you don't mind. Of course, if you don't want to present, that's fine. I'm going to look for some names that I haven't seen. Eloise Pomfret, would you like to present? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't expect to be on this. I just saw on the internet and um, I know Mike Krasowitz and so I thought, oh, that's an opportunity to say hello and get to meet people. I'm in Michigan here on the quarantine. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have anything ready, but I would love to do that next time or another time that it's possible. Of course, of course. And welcome, welcome. Glad you found your way to our group. Um, okay, Olga so Alexander, would you like to present? Share your uh work. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about what I have. I haven't present. I haven't organized anything, so you have to forgive, forgive me if it's disorganized. But that's me. I like fragmentation. I, I finally have owned it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I like it. So although I bounce back, sometimes I think I better pull myself in. It, 
if I want to make sense if, or if I want somebody else to make sense of, of something. So anyway, I'll start with, I don't know if you could see it, my, this painting behind me. I don't know, let me know if you can see it. If not, yeah. can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, I recently, oh, there we go. Yeah, I recently finished it and um, now I'm having some other problems. I thought it was gonna be part of a series, but maybe not. Um, I, I just like the fluidity of it and the kind of a, a Max Ernst uh, kind of feel because I was looking a lot at my floorboards and I at one point felt I was just gonna go through my floorboards. But um, I thought of, uh, you know, making it my subject matter. I like to be a conceptual type of artist. I like abstraction, but I'm not a figurative abstract artist. So I thought at this time I'd use my time uh, to challenge myself into other areas I haven't looked at before, like figurative uh, abstraction for one. But um, I recently, I, I, maybe somebody could help me with this painting though before I move on. Uh, I use a cheap um, canvas and now it's warping in one and it, you may be able to see the shadow. It's lifting off the wall. It's not laying flat. I have no idea what to do with it. So if anybody has an idea what to what do with it. What does the back of it look like? What? The, the back, back of it. it. Is it just a typical, you just have a frame around in the back? Stretch, stretcher bars? A yeah. cheap front canvas board, yeah. Oh, oh board? Oh. oh. So, yeah, uh, you know, uh, Olga, you could mount it to a frame. You would have to glue it down to a frame and put it under weights. Uh, okay. You may have to make sure that the frame is is um, not warped also, and then yeah. it will straighten out. Oh, well, okay, that's a thought. I hadn't thought about that. Thanks, Fran. Uh, okay. The series that I finished um, that I'm actually very happy about um, but maybe you I don't know do you want to see the fragmented wall that I work off of every morning yes. Oh, yes. Okay. I'd like to see closer of the painting behind you oh okay let me see if I could move everything so you can see it. you see it now excellent yeah, yeah. oh layers and blues. I like this. Oh thing. yeah, the blues. Look at that. Look at that. Uh, actually from the side it looks like it's all dripping, so mm. which is something I like. But really there. Nice. That's it. And then talk about figuration. I started playing around with abstract uh, figurations here. Mm. Uh, she looks like she's boxed in and she is as I am. Um and and then I moved recently. Well, here's a here's when I'm bouncing. Oops. Oh, recently I cut up a lot of my uh, paintings on paper, mm -hmm. and I like the pieces so much. I put them up, and I thought they looked better, and they could suggest other paintings to me uh, that way. Because I didn't like it when they were uh, you know one piece. But that piece right there on the wall with the black, it looks like ribs. What, this? This, yeah, it looks like ribs with sort of like a blue... Like yeah, that, that's a work on paper I just finished um, with acrylic. Uh -huh. uh, that's kind of uh, new for me, too. Um, I just, I didn't think of anything in particular. I just just started to, to uh, move uh, color and uh, play with that. I'm sorry. Haunting. Uh, there's one. There's a few pieces there. Okay. And, okay. Hold on. I can't hear all of you, but uh, let me show this last. I don't know. If oh, Wait, yeah, we're I seeing like the top. Yeah. <laughs> All right, hold on. This oh, that's a good idea. She's going to bring the painting to the computer. Yeah. This. Yeah. Oh, nice. wow. Cool. So um, this is what I'm working on. It's not anywhere near finished, so. But I don't know what it's going to be, but I like the fragmentation of it. And yeah. it's 
testing of a figure. Is that a, also on board? Is that on canvas board or masonite? What is that on? Oh, no, it's on canvas. Okay. Yeah, it's can, acrylic on canvas. Can you turn the, uh, if you don't mind, can you put the blue on the bottom? Say what? Can you turn the canvas around counterclockwise so the blue is on the bottom? She, no, Olga, she wants you to actually turn the canvas upside down so she can see how it looks in another way. Oh, oh this, oh, this large one. Oh, okay. That's when you just yeah. Have. And you know, <laughs> Olga, Olga, okay. hold it against the wall because we can't see the whole thing. Yeah. No, I want the blue on the bottom. Turn it a, yeah, uh, one more time, yeah, turn it. One more time, one more time. Ah, uh, okay. Olga, why do you call this fragmentation? Say what? Why do you call this fragmentation? Uh, why do I call it fragmentation? I call most of my work is fragmentation. Because um, it's sort of different aspects trying to gel, coming together into a whole and not quite getting there. And uh, I think if I make this into a series, then I think you'll see the iterations more, how the fragmentation plays out. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't gel into anything. It, it's, it could be one big blob, it could be a face, it could be different parts of a body, it could be many things at this time. So to me, you know, uh, that's what there, I feel like. There's something about it that reminds me, Sandra speaking, uh, when I did the Camp Nine, the, uh, the drawing to the left, the painting to the left, there's the blue on the bottom. It, I see. Which one on the left? My my own my Camp Nine um, painting that I showed two of the pieces, Cancer and Threads of Hope. The Cancer one, the 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 strength of your breaststroke and the circular motion, the convoluted motion. And the reason I liked it, the way I asked, if you don't mind, with the blue on the bottom, is that I could see this almost skull-like formation. Yeah. And to the right of it, I do see a, a figure, a human figure. Yeah. What I liked about it too was you know, there's, I think it's Leonard Cohn again. Uh, he has a song, Man on a Wire. And there's just that thin gray from the skull, what I'm seeing is a skull, that line coming down. But it's a, it's a rhythm that goes through the entire piece. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other way around, I'm losing that big, strong rhythm. Oh, OK. I'm going to have to look, uh, turn it around. Yeah. yeah, it's very exciting. Very exciting. Okay. Thank you. But um, I've been working a lot in spite of the isolation. I totally relate to what Wendy said. Very often, you know, you don't want to hear your own voice anymore. And so you just want to work with color and get into the color, which is what I love. You know, the, the way it looks, the way it feels, the mass of it. But what I'm most proud of, at least on a personal level, is that I did complete a series <laughs> haunting me. And uh, it's like over 30 pieces and two large pieces, but I'm not going to show you. I'm just going to show you a couple. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, oops. Did you, where did everybody go? Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. You can see that. What sort of a yeah, sort of a figure submerged. Um, these are hard to see, actually. I, I, I know that. I'm not even going to try to show you the dark ones. Um, there's. Can you back up? We can't see yeah. the whole piece. And the reflection from your screen. Yeah, well, they're, 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 it is very glossy So uh, already. Let me see if I have one that isn't so glossy. There you go. <coughs> there you go. 
Oops. So this is like, like a figure, but that I have spray painted. And then I have uh, sort of uh, splashes of color, like water and uh, dark. I have some that are light and then I have some that are very, very dark. Um, so, you know, sort of uh, what I was going through anyway. It's Thank you very much. hard to show it to you. I was not prepared, but that's, hopefully that gives you a little bit. Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks. Well, Olga, Olga, that was great. You were very Thanks. prepared. It was a pleasure I to I see. Wasn't prepared. Me, I wasn't prepared. Uh, but thank you. Know, you. It, yeah, no, very nice. And I, I want to thank everybody. It was a nice sort of group connection going on today where everybody shared some thoughts when they looked at other artists' work. And I, I thought it was very nice. The questions and everything. I think we've... Uh, I think we've stepped forward even a little more as a group. Um, I'm going to bring the meeting to a close. I just want to thank you all. Again, we're Artists Talk on Art. I want to apologize um, to anyone who did not get to present tonight. We do this every Monday night. You can always send me an email before we do the talk, and then I will schedule you in. Um, we're happy to um, keep coming, spread the word. Um, I think we've created something good. It's our 19th talk. We are a 501c3. This is our response to COVID. And I, I think you all have made this what we hope it would be. It's artists talking on art in a very positive format. And I think many of you have said how we share and we learn from sharing. So I just gotta say thank you to everybody. Thank you, Barry. Thanks for being a part of this. Thank you. Sorry, I was traveling today. Thank you, Barry. Um, Thank you, Barry. We enjoyed it so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. See you next week. Yes. See you next week. Good night. Thank you. Bye.